deep stand for the reading of the scripture. This will be the main scripture for the sermon. It comes out of Mark 12 and 28 through 34. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one another, love one's neighbor as oneself, is much more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And then Jesus saw that he answered wisely, and he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Amen. Well, once again, uh, welcome to Grace Lake. We are glad you're here. If you're visiting with us, uh, don't leave without getting a gift uh, from us. Uh, so it's a small gift. It's not my garage, but it's a gift. Uh, and we want to give it to you. So, uh, Anyway, again, this is, um, we're continuing on in the Gospel of Mark. And today we come to one of the, again, the great, it is the greatest commandment. Uh, he summarizes the, Jesus summarizes the greatest commandment. So, you know, no big deal. Uh, but we're going to, we're going to attempt to, I'm going to attempt to preach the greatest commandment this morning. Uh, so with that, uh, let's go to the Lord and pray one more time. Lord Jesus, thank you for this word. It is your word. It is your breath on the page. And Father, I often just feel inadequate. A, and that's the, that's the point where we're, we are not to boast in our strength. And that is really the point of this great command, where we are to love you. And so, Holy Spirit, would you use, would you just use the proclamation of your word this morning to draw far distant hearts to you? And would you also, if there is someone that is like the scribe, who they're close, but they're not in, because they have not rested in your finished work, I pray that you would do the miracle this morning and awaken faith. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, well, I know I've shared my testimony in different contexts before, so I am so, so sorry if uh, you've heard this, um, but I, part of my testimony is um, my freshman year of college was a life-changing year for me. I grew up in the church as a PK, um, I was the rowdy PK, um, I was the PK again that had, you know, just the pastor had a meeting. Uh, with my family and me about my behavior. Uh, and so it, it, was, it, was, it was crazy. But freshman year, I remember one of my friends gave me a book called Crazy Love by Francis Chan and I uh, recommend that book. And again, in that book, he, he comes uh, to a part in that first chapter and he says, I want you to put this book down and I want you to watch this, uh, pull up this clip and watch this film. And the film is called uh, Stop and Think. Stop and think. And this week I actually rewatched it and I realized how dated it was. And it got that my heart sunk a little bit. I was like, man, I am getting, I don't know, I'm getting, I'm getting there. I got some great going on. And, and anyway, it just, uh, and stop and think. And it's just simply Francis Chan walking on the beach in Southern California. He's got a surfboard and he's walking and he's just sharing the gospel. He's just sharing the gospel. And I was like, ah, okay. And at this stage in my walk uh, with Jesus. I was like the scribe in this passage. I thought Christianity was all about morality. 
So I mean, I mean, literally, I, I, um, and, and this is no fault to my mom and dad. They preached gospel. They brought me up in church. But I think it was just my misconception of what Christianity was. It was a bunch of lists of do's and don'ts and, and just morality. Just how this is about morality. You just got to be good, and that's what Christianity is. I didn't really have to light. And I'm going to be honest, there's a lot of Christians who don't have to light. They're not joyful Christians. I'm like, what did you do? Do something else, I guess. There's a better hobby. I mean, just, just the light. I was missing the light. And so anyway, again, this he said this phrase, and this phrase has forever changed me. And I don't know what it was, and you might be, oh yeah, I've, I've, I've heard this, and I've done this, but this phrase forever changed me. He says this. He said, the whole message, the whole message of the Bible, it, it the whole message of the Bible in heaven isn't about a creator, it's not about a creator that wants to take from you. It's not about a, a God that just wants to take from you and here's all these commands that just makes your life miserable. Not, no, but an amazing God who wants to give life. A God that wants to actually, his commands are to, the commands of God are to take, but to give. They're actually for your good and for your joy. And see, again, I, the, the problem for us today is we, we come to a text like this and we read a commandment like this. Love God with all. And love neighbor with all. And you think, how in the world am I going to do that? Does everybody feel the weight of the great commandment? Has everybody ever read it and felt like, Wow, I don't really measure up. And, and, and the, the reality is, you can respond to the commandments of God in two ways. You can respond to the commandments of God. Of, oh yeah, I can do this for the strength. I'm going to knock it out of the park. Or you can humble yourself to the reality of how you fall short. And we can look to Jesus and find a new delight in the commandments. That the commandments of God are actually for your good. They're for your joy. And the main point, if you're just really taking notes again in this, in your bulletin, because Jesus is the only one who loved God and made it perfectly, we must look to him to keep the great commandment. But the question I have is, what does looking to Jesus look like? What does looking to Jesus look like in order to keep the great commandment. And I have two observations. Looking to Jesus brings light in the commandment, and looking to Jesus keeps us from missing the great commandment. You tracking? That's where we're going. We're ready. Stretch it out. Okay, here we go. Alright, so verse 28. Observation one. Looking to Jesus brings the light in the great commandment. So Jesus, uh, again in chapter 12, he's, uh, he's being interrogated. We talked about this last week. He's He's been, um, uh, been interrogated by the Herodians last week, and he won that interrogation, won those questions, and now uh, he, he was interrogated by the Sadducees, and he's won that. Uh, but now he's approached. He's approached by a single scribe. A single scribe. Uh, verse 20 it says, one scribe. And, and this is really, this is fascinating, because this scribe isn't, uh, it, it's unlike any other of the, the interrogations so far. Because this scribe, we're going to find out, does not have so much a heart of malice. But we find that this scribe is actually, he's coming to Jesus with a good approach. He actually wants to, 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 to see more of who Jesus is. I mean, look at verse 20. It says, he heard them disputing with one another and seeing that he answered them well. So this scribe is like, wow, I'm intrigued. I've been looking on how you've been answering these Herodians and scribes. And so now I'm, I'm coming. I'm, I'm intrigued. And, and I, I want to I ask you a question. And this question is genuine. It's not some like crazy question scenario like the Sadducees gave about like all these you know, it, it's a, a genuine question. He says, okay, which commandment is most important of all? And I don't know about you, but I mean, with five kids in the home, I, there's, there's a, a series of what's the greatest? Anybody get these questions? Well, what's the greatest basketball player of all time? Which is fine, MJ. Don't even, I mean, it's not even a question. Okay? That was my childhood. 
MJ was my hero, my Jesus at that time. He didn't say that, that but anyway, um, it, it's MJ. Or, or, you know, the greatest book, okay, the greatest car, you know, the greatest musical, the greatest, I don't know what out here, the greatest CDUs, I don't know what it is, you know, just what's the greatest? We all like what's the greatest. And, and the scribe um, who worked, by the way, you got to think about this, he worked in the temple. Here's a guy who worked with the law, and he would have known, listen, all 613 commandments at this time. 613. Okay? Um, 365 were negatives, you shall not. 248 were positives. Some were light, some were more heavy. Light meaning, you know, there wasn't that much serious repercussion. If you, you broke it, and some were heavy, like this was serious. And so this guy has a genuine thing. He said, hey, which one? Jesus, out of all these 613, I want to know, I want to know one. Which one is it? And this time, Jesus just comes right out. So I got it. Here it is. The most important is here. O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love and follow your heart, soul, mind, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. The scribe would have probably done this. Because he would have known this is Deuteronomy. He would have instantly known this is Deuteronomy 6 4. Every, um, every Jew would have known this. This was De Deuteronomy 6 4 through 5, um, was like the John 3 16 of the Jew. They had their little football games, whatever they would do. This was under their eyelids. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5. Okay, this is it. This was the, this was called the Shema. And you're like, what? Everybody say Shema. There you go. You just spoke Hebrew. Um, don't think I ever talked anymore. So the Shema is it just means listen, hear. Tell it starts. Listen, hear. And, and it's calling them to listen. And this would have been on the door frames. I mean, again, you can go to Deuteronomy 6. All parents, you should memorize Deuteronomy all of 6. And, and, and because it's like, hey, you know, teach this to your children. Here it is. Put this on the door frames. Put this everywhere. Put it on your foreheads. I mean, put it everywhere. It would have known this in there. And notice the word all. And we don't, we don't have time to get into every single one of these, but it says all heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus adds mind, but the, the Hebrew, um, I, I think if you really dive into the Hebrew, in, in the Shema and Deuteronomy 6, that, that mind is there, it's encompassed, it, it's, in, it's in those words. But Jesus is basically saying, we could say how the heart and soul and it's different and all that, but he really, he's really just saying, is you love God with everything. There it is. No way around it. All. All you, the, the depths of your heart, the depths of your truth, the depths of your mind, you're trying to love God. But what's really important, so that's important, it's all, it's all, but what's really important in the Shema, I think, is in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 and 5, and if you want to flip there in your Bible, you can, you, you'll notice that when it says, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one, it is a capital L-O-R-D. You buy what? It's just, this print of that, but anytime you see the capital L O R D, it is referring to the name of God that was given Yahweh. He's saying Yahweh is real. He's one. Yahweh. And why am I like, no, Brent, like, calm down. Like, Y'all look at me like I'm. It's a personal name. It's a personal God. He's saying, Yahweh is, Yahweh is who you're supposed to love. It, it's his name that, that, that is supposed to, out of your heart, bring Ireland to love him. It's referring to his name. So uh, R.C. Sproul's, I found this interesting this week. R.C. Sproul tells the story of a young woman uh, and, and he, he teaches in a seminary he used to, 
And this young woman, uh, her name was Mary. She came into class and she felt gay and excited. And, you know, she's, and, and she's pulling him in. Uh, and he notices she's got a ring on her finger. He says, oh, Mary, did you, did you get engaged? She's like, yes, to John. And John's right there. And it's like, oh, John. And it's just, he's like, oh, that's great, Mary. And he's like, okay, Mary, you know, can, can, before we start class today, can we, can I just, can I just ask you, do you, do you love John? And Mary's like, you know, I can only imagine. R.C. Scroll is not a good Mary. I can only imagine this poor girl. Like, and she's like, oh, of course I love John. And he's like, okay, Mary. Why do you love John? And she thought for a second, and she says, well, I just, I just, oh, I just, I just love John because he's so intelligent. Marcy responds, like, well, you, you, I mean, I totally, totally agree. I mean, the brother's got, he's, he's on the dean's list every, every year. This guy's got a 3.8. He is, he's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant student. But Bill, over here, Bill's got a 4.0. Um, he's on the dean's list, too, and he's got a 4.0. Would, hey, Mary, would you say, a uh, Bill is intelligent? She said, well, of course you're good you, but you don't love Bill. Well, no, I don't love Bill. I love John. <laughs> you can just imagine. I mean, or she's like, okay, okay, well, come on, Mary. I mean, tell me something. I mean, why do you love John? That's not Bill. She said, well, I just love him because he's just so athletic. And R.C. scrolls again, and he's like, well, I mean, you're right. Yeah. He's, he's got, I mean, he's a starter on the basketball team. He's got a great crossover. He's, he's, he's a really, really good basketball player. But Bill is the leading scorer. And you don't love Bill. Who the hell love Bill? And at this time now, R.C., he just keeps going. I don't have time. He starts asking about how polite John is. and I mean, she goes in about how polite John is and what Bill's polite. And, and she, at this time, he's like, this poor girl's about to cry in the class. And I would, I would be crying. R.C. schools interrogating me about the love. I mean, and at this time, she's probably questioning her love for the uh, Maybe I should marry Bill. I don't know. And, and finally, she's, he just says, okay, just, or she's like, just come on, Mary, tell me something. Why do you love John? Why, why? And she, she goes, well, I just, I love him because just, because he's John. And R.C. finally says, yes, Mary. Yes. You love him because he's John. When you ran out of things to describe you went to his name. You went to his name. Listen, we love God, not because he's intelligent, not because he's strong, not because he's kind, not because he's this. We love God because he's God. The essence of who he is, he a he is wonderful. And just in the sense of his delight, we don't. We don't come to like, you get to a new stage of understanding who God is when you love Him, not because of something He gives you, but because of who He is. You come to Jesus to get God, period. That is enough. We, we love Him for who He is. And see, the ultimate, He's God is the ultimate, sovereign, infinite, holy, <coughs> all loving, perfectly satisfying being in the universe. And have you ever wondered this ultimate, personal, intimate, ultra satisfying God commands you to love Him? And you think, sometimes, I mean, if you really dig down deep, you're like, well, that sounds a little. I mean, you talk to someone about Christina. Your God commands you to love Him? Seems a little selfish. Seems like he's a little like, egomaniac up in this in the skies. That would be weird. Like, you will love me. Very soon. But it's selfish if you don't understand God's intentions and in commands. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 6, 24 says, And the Lord commanded us to do all these things to fear the Lord our God for our good. For our good 
always that he might preserve us. Jeremiah 32, 39 says the same thing. Over and over and over again, you get this idea that this, this phrase. Here's the command. It's for your good. And, and, and I mean, even if you think about it in the beginning, when he says, I mean, don't, don't eat. I'm going to give you everything, but don't eat of this one. It's, he's not trying to keep, he's trying to give. See, we have to understand that our God has our greatest good and greatest joy in mind. My question to you, though, I, mean, think, I want you to really think about this. Do you want this? Do you want your greatest good and your greatest joy in life? I got it. Do you want that? The all-satisfying God says, here it is. Where you're going to get your greatest good and your greatest joy is in me. I'm going to give you myself. See, suppose a mother uh, rushes to help her terrified child uh, and she acts out of spontaneous love. Uh, and she would be even offended. And she would be offended by maybe the suggestion that she must run to her child out of maybe a sense of legal duty. I mean, in one sense, yes, a mother has an obligation and a right to care for her child, but she must run to him, not merely out of a legal sense of obligation, but she must run to her child because she has such great affection for her child. See, Christianity, when we understand this infinite, holy, all-satisfying God commands me to love Him, it is only for my good and my joy, and, I've, and, and, and the sense of obligation, I, I, I have to, I, you know, if you start there, well, I have to, I, I have to love Him, I have to love Him, we're missing it, we get to love Him. It's this sense of overwhelming, I get to come to Him. And when we look to Him, and we love Him, and we treasure Him as the ultimate satisfaction, satisfaction of our hearts, then all the other treasures that our hearts want to see that begin to fall. Money, career, possession, health, pleasure. Our hearts are satisfied. Our hearts are satisfied. We get to love God because He gives us Himself. But notice too, Jesus then says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And this is a, this is a quotation from uh, Leviticus 19.18 and this is really interesting because this would have been the first time uh, Jesus um, or any, I mean, anybody would have would brought the Shema and this together into one command. One command. And, and notice though, I want you to notice a lot of people kind of, we, we, we might have we might tear these two apart that Jesus is combining love God okay, love neighbor, as if to say as if to say this you can't love neighbor. There's priority here. You cannot love neighbor with the intention that you're supposed to really love neighbor without loving God. Loving God is the fuel to loving neighbor. And if we reverse the order, if we start with, okay, i got to love neighbor, um, and, and this is, this is, this is tragic because then we seek neighbor. We seek, and, and neighbor is encompass. I mean, it's everybody. Your enemies, everybody. We tend to, it includes everybody. And if we listen, if you start with loving neighbor, and you start with the 
try to seek um, loving neighbor and loving them first over God, trying to get validation out of man, it will be an endless cycle of up and down. Because even, even the closest people to you are going to, they're sinful. They're going to abandon you. At some point, they're going to break you. They're going to sin against you. And, and, and the reality is, no one, and this sounds like a Backstreet Boys song, and I'm sorry, but no one can love you like I can. Copyright. <laughs> New Christian song. But that is serious. And if you, you start there, and if you're like, I don't really love neighbor very much. I've been really, everybody just, to, to, to neighbor, neighbor, to, I can say, well, how are you loving God? Are you loving God? Are you satisfied? Just don't, don't, don't say, I got to change to how I love neighbor. No, look at God. Look again on the gospel. And uh, again, we don't have time to get all into this, but I've heard this, well, oh uh, yeah, love your neighbor as yourself. So it's all about you first. You, 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 see, yeah, you get all about you. You know, I've heard the illustration, well, you know, the oxygen mask comes down and it says, put it on you first before you put it on the other. And there's some real sense of like, yes, like there's, you need to care, you need to care for yourself. But he's not saying, Jesus is not saying, okay, you first, and then once you just got for yourself, it's all about you. You get you out of the way, and you just love you forever, forever, ever, you, you, you. Then I guess when you got like a second, you love you. No, that's it. Jesus is assuming you love yourself. I love this. He's already assuming you love yourself. He, Jesus is already assuming that you're going to wake up and go, I want something to eat. I, I, I need something. I, I want this. I want this. I need this. I need this. And Jesus is just saying, I want you to want that for someone else. More. I want you to want that. See, and if, if, if our ultimate good, we get our ultimate good and ultimate joy in loving God, then the ultimate thing we can do for our neighbor is help them to love God. Are you tracking? And see the, the and uh, I love it when modern science catches up with the Bible. It just always happens. It's just, I mean, secular counselors will tell you over and over and over again. I mean, I. Most of them have had some conversations like, we'll tell you over and over again, the most unhappy people, why are the ones that are always thinking of them? I just think of them. And one of the first, in this, and again, in secular counseling, the first thing they give the people with extreme depression or hurt, right, is, is they just say, go serve somebody. And see, the reality is, again, once again, we get the idea that the command is not to take it to give. Because we're finding our greatest joy in actually laying down our life for neighbor. Because this is not this is what it is. And the second one, and this is not as long, if you're like, wow, uh, sorry, I'm wondering the last, last page of my life. This is, Shorter point is looking to Jesus keeps us from missing the great commandment. And this is, if you have to, this is this is serious. I mean, verse 32, the scribe agrees, so he agrees, like, yeah, yeah, I agree. You're right. You agree to correctly, he says. To love God and neighbor is right. Yep, I get that. Uh, but notice verse 33. If you have your uh, he says, This, this meaning love God and neighbor, is much more than whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. So we quote Hosea 6, um, uh, 6, which is really interesting. And then Jesus says something really alarming. He answered, he said, well, you can answer wisely. So again, he's like, this scribe is in, he's, he's, he's got a neighbor. He said, you're answered wisely. You can answer him. But then he says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. He, this is what Jesus says. He says, you're close, but you're not quite in. You're at the door, you're there, but you have not stepped over the threshold. 
And I want you to get who this scribe is. Track with me. He believed the Bible. Okay? This man knew the commandments. He worshipped in the synagogue. Went to church. He's a church man. Bible, commandments, church man. Okay? And he even knew that loving God and neighbor is more than, it's better than all the religious activities such as tithing and praying. So he, he even knew that. But he missed it. He was close, but he wasn't in. And many today are on the edge. They're close. They're standing on the edge. They're right there. But they're freshmen. They need to step over the freshmen. And the reality is this. The big question is, why? Why was he so close but missed the kingdom? Why? Why are so many of us so close and yet we miss the kingdom? And the reality is, he should have fallen on his face. He should have fallen in so many of us miss it because we think again we can keep it, it the great commandment in our self described We missed it because he thought we could do it. And he, what he needed in that moment was the inner part of his heart to respond in faith and say, I need Jesus. Because again, no one is perfectly obeying you. The heart. Perfectly. Jesus did. And so, the reality is, we, we get into the kingdom, not by our doing, but again by us following. But here in the close, this is why it was so amazing. The Ten Commandments, which sums up all the great commandments, I mean, the greatest commandment of the first four. The first four is uh, all about loving God. The, the last uh, six is all about loving neighbor. Do you know what's amazing about this? So Moses was a smart man. He knew he knew that people were going to be like, what? why should I do that? What? what? Moses, why should I obey all these commandments? Like, there's a lot. Why, why should I do that? Moses was a smart man. You know how he pinned? The first thing he pinned before he actually listened to the commandments is what he said. Exodus 20, verse 2. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. This is what Moses did. He said, well, why should you obey the commandments? Why should you do all this? What's the response? Can you there be asking? What does Moses do? He tells a story. He tells a story of God's grace. Look what God has done for you. Look again. Israelites, you were, you were in bondage. I delivered you. I brought you out. Okay, I, I, I'm the one who came to you first. And now, here it is. Look again, Israelites. Here's the story. Do you know that's what we do every single Sunday is we rehearse the story of God's grace in the person, his life, his death, his resurrection of King Jesus. And we look again at Jesus. We rehearse the story here. Look at Jesus. Look at his grace. Look who he is. We don't start with, hey, do this, do that. Here's how you should do it. We look to Jesus because if we don't start by looking to Jesus, you will not have power. You will not have power to, to then move out. And do this great commandment. It's out of the overflow of looking to Jesus that we, and, and knowing that it is for our good that He says, Love me and love me. That's right. Lord, thank you so much for this word. I pray that Father, you take this word and Holy Spirit use it in a way that would draw this congregation, these people, right now to you. Just draw them to you. Wherever they're at. Lord, and I'm praying specifically if there's someone on the threshing floor that they've been dabbling in, should I trust in Jesus? And they think Christianity is again um, uh, church attendance, doing this, doing that. Lord, again, I pray that they would see the great call this morning that Jesus, you first loved them. And that they would they would give up themselves. 
future leaders of jazz music, they would they would give up themselves. They, they and they would rest as the song just rest in you, Jesus. And as we look to you and your great grace, Lord, I pray that you can empower us to love you. Knowing that loving you and loving neighbor is always going to increase our joy. It's always going to increase our good. And it's always going to magnify you.